right. All right. You ready to get in the Word today? Let's do it. I am going to go tableless. I'm going to roam free up here. You got to pay attention to me. I might walk down there where you're at, look you right in the face just to make sure you're listening. All right? I'll make you as uncomfortable as possible. All right? So be ready. Be ready for that. I wouldn't do that. I might, though. All right. Uh, I want to open up with a verse this morning. So uh, when I got the opportunity to, to know that I was going to be ministering on December 1st, I'm one of those guys, as you can tell by my attire, I take every chance I get uh, when, when it's Christmas time, Christmassy, I like to talk about the Christmas story as we know it in the Bible. It's one of my, it's one of my favorite things to read every year. I started reading Luke chapter 1 uh, two weeks ago, just kind of looking through it, and some stuff came up, and so fortunately I get to talk about some of that stuff today with you. But I want to open up in Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. If you can put that up, in the, we're going to look at it in the New King James and then in the Passion Translation. But it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on, and on earth peace. What? Good will toward men. Good will toward men. You know what good will is? You know, basically what good will is, it's, it's a will for good. I mean, if you break that word down, I didn't even look that up. <laughs> I didn't look it up. Maybe I'm wrong and they're trying to trick us here. But I'm assuming that goodwill means a will for good. Yeah. You know what verse that reminds me of? Jeremiah 29, 11. You, you've seen it in every football program ever for graduating seniors, right? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're, they're good plans. They're plans to give you hope and a future. He's talking about good will here toward men. In the Passion Translation, it says, Then all at once a vast number of glorious angels appeared, the very armies of heaven. And they all praised God, singing glory to God in the highest realms of heaven, for there is peace and a good hope given to the sons of men. A good hope given to the sons of men. Man, you know that more than just a seasonal feeling that you might get during this time of year, there is actual, real, tangible hope available to you today. Yeah. Just because it's December 1st and we've got the Christmas trees up and we sing joy to the world and I'm wearing this tremendous Christmas jacket, <laughs> that is not uh, the reason for hope. There is a reason that you can have actual hope today. You could have come into this place hopeless, feeling like, feeling like you had no hope. You might, you might think that there are some good things going on in my life. There's a lot of good in my life, but there's this one area where I just feel like there's no hope. You should leave here today knowing that you have hope in that area right there. I'm going to hit on this at the very end today, but, but if you've given your life to Jesus, I want, to, I want to declare to you right now, you are never in a hopeless situation. You are never, a Christian can never find him or herself in a hopeless situation. You have the hope, the source of all hope, living on the inside of you. So if there's something dark in your life, if there's something about the holidays maybe that you, that you don't like, there's bad memories that you have from them, that can change this year. Yeah. Yeah. That can change today. Yeah. It can change today, and that's my hope for you, is that you will have hope and your head's lifted as you leave this place today. Yeah. And for the rest of this season and going forward into a new year, man, God, God wants the best for you. Yeah. He wants the very best for you. Uh, let's pray real quick before we get started. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you are our hope. You are the source of hope. I thank you for your word this morning, and I ask that you would just speak through me today, that we would hear what you have to say to us, because it's that. It's your word that gives us hope. Your word and your word alone is what brings hope, and it's what fulfills it in our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you, show of hands, how many of you... Um, do we have any, let me, I, don't, I don't know how to do this. Do we have any kids in here that aren't in kids' class? Like, let's say, okay, I, I know you. Uh, do we have any, man, this is tough. You know what? You're in, you're in big church today, and your parents brought you to big church, and now all the parents are nervous about what I'm about to say. So, <laughs> so, so we've got kids' classes for this reason, all right? I'm not going to, it's not that bad, maybe. <laughs> this is your fault if, if it is, but. <laughs> How many of you still believe in Santa Claus? Huh? 
Oh, there are some adults. This is backfired on me. <laughs> Praise God. Good for you. Good for you. But you know, it's one of those things. Uh, I was thinking about this, and we were watching. We were watching Elf last night. Uh, when I got back from Chick Fil A, that's what was on. And so we were watching Elf, and it was the part, and I'm going to talk to you like you've seen Elf. If you haven't seen Elf, then I don't know what to tell you. I, don't know, I really don't know how to, how to tell you. You need to go see that movie. But anyway, so they were in Central Park, and, you know, Santa's sleigh is breaking down. And I never really liked this depiction of Santa. I'm like, why do we have a, uh, an engine on Santa's sleigh? It's kind of ridiculous, really. I mean... Uh, I get that Christmas spirit is down and everything, but like, the reindeer are the, thing, the, the, the things that make Santa's sleigh fly, right? Yeah. Let's not be ridiculous and put some type of jet engine on this thing. <laughs> and, and I always love, and I know it's a movie, and so forgive me here, but I just love how like Buddy the Elf just like noticed Santa. is like, hey, that's Santa. He's going to wreck in Central Park. I know right where to go, <laughs> right? And then, and then, Buddy, Buddy's dad and his, his brother show up there too. I'm like, wow, this worked out. And no one else is around in the park. This is amazing, right? And so, and so his, little, you know, his little brother, Michael, he doesn't believe in Santa anymore, but he finds Santa's nice and naughty list, right? And he finds his nice and naughty list, and he sees that he's got a skateboard on there. It's not just any skateboard. It's the skateboard that he asked for, right? And Santa needs that engine on his sleigh because Christmas spirit is down because people just don't believe in him anymore. Right? And so he saw that, and the spiritometer, or whatever that thing is, it jumped up a little bit. Like there was a little belief there, right? And it, I was thinking about this message with that too. Belief is a very powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing. I mean, when you believe something, you'll go out of your way to see and hear things that enforce your belief in that. You know, I, I remember when we were kids, Kylie was convinced that she saw Santa on Christmas Eve. And, and you know, parents go a long ways to, to convince their kids that Santa is real, right? I mean, we had ho-ho-hos through our house. We had all these things going on on Christmas Eve. She, she was convinced she saw Santa fly off in his sleigh because she believed in Santa Claus, yeah. right? Yeah. You, know, you know, these little elves that, that people are doing now? I hate the elves, these little elves. Yes, thank you. I got an amen on that. I mean, that's going to be the only one I get today. But these little elves, and it's our fault. Like, you, you know, you participate in doing the elf thing, and like, oh, the elf showed up. The elf appeared, and he did this and that. And it's got to the point where, like, these elves are out. We, have, we didn't do it. They're just out. They're Christmas decorations. And our kids are like, oh, the, the elves are out. They moved. I'm like, they didn't move. I picked him up and I threw him over there. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm done with this part. Like, I, I'm going to keep the Santa thing going for right now, but I'm done with the elf part. The elf isn't real. He didn't come from the North Pole. This is a doll. It's like your other dolls. I, put him, I, took, I picked him up and I threw him over there. He, that's how he got there, okay? <laughs> and I hate to do that, but she just, she talked about this all the time, like this elf kept moving. No, it didn't. It did not. And then she said something about Santa, and I'm like, I just ignored her and walked off. Like, I just, I'm not quite ready. Like, we're, I believed in Santa when I was a little kid, and I, you can do whatever you want to as a parent, and, I, and I've kind of been struggling with this, but the kind of the way that we've framed it is like, yeah, I mean, what, Santa really works for Jesus, though, right? Come on, he works for God. He just, he delivers God's blessings to us. You know, that, because I can't let my kids know that Santa is the source of all this stuff. Man, if you have anything good in your life, it's from God. He's the source of, he's the source of everything that's good. So, so Santa, he works for God. That's, that's kind of how we frame it. In fact, there's no comparison between God and Santa. No comparison. Matt, you were trying, Matt was trying to, he thought I had a game called God versus Santa. Is that what it was? Jesus versus Santa. He said, can I borrow that game? He texted me that. I said, I have no idea what in the world you're talking about. <laughs> and apparently it is a real game out there, right? They told me it's a real game. But I remember doing this message uh, years and years ago, like seven or eight years ago, and I used this slide up here just during Christmas, and it was God versus Santa. It was like Father Christmas versus Father God, right? 
And there's no comparison. You know when I was doing that? You know what I was putting on each side? Like one year, Santa got me a Nintendo 64, which was like the best present ever. If you're, if you're in your, you know, your 30s like me, Nintendo 64, I got Goldeneye, James Bond, that same Christmas. This is the best game ever, guys. <laughs> but then I went over to the other side, and I, and I was doing God, and I was like, eternal salvation. I'm like, it's just better than a Nintendo 64. <laughs> I can't get around that. It just is, right? It just is. It's better. God's better. He's greater. He's got better gifts. So anyway... Santa works for God. But I want to go back to the whole belief thing. Like I said, belief is a powerful thing. Kids will will see things and hear things, and it will convince them and reinforce their belief that Santa is real and Santa does all this stuff, right? But the opposite is true, too. Once you don't believe in Santa, or if you don't believe in something, certain things that you see, hear, and experience will reinforce your your unbelief in that. Right? Right? And so belief is very powerful, and, here, and here's my favorite thing about belief, or if we want to use the Bible word for that, faith. You can choose what you believe. Like, you don't, you don't even have to base your life experience on what you believe. You can actually, as a human being with free will, choose what you believe. You have that choice. The power of choice is one of the things that we underrate so much. I have the power of choice. Nobody can choose for me. I get to choose what I want to believe. When someone says, I can't believe that, that's a lie. They can believe that all they want to. They choose not to believe that. Right? And I think that we've become so lax with the power of our own choice and thinking that we can only believe really what, what our lives have led us to believe because of this or because of that, when really... It's our choice what we want to believe. And so when it comes to things in God's word and and the promises of God's word, man, you can believe them. You can believe them if you want to. If you want to. And so I'm going to talk about this a little bit this morning. In fact, if you were here last week, our youth pastor, Pastor Ben, taught a message and he was talking about how the, the, the plan is the promise, the promise is the plan. It's the same thing. And he started talking about some of the promises of God. And it, it was one of these messages that I've heard, you know, over the last 20, 25 years, I hear about God's promises for you. How many of you have heard about God's promises for you? God has good promises for you. Well, I feel like as a church, and, and, and as this church in particular, there are some of us who have heard that, but you're going to have to hear it again, and there are some of you who haven't heard that God has good promises for you, and you need to hear that there are promises in God's Word that are specifically for you, and there's no reason that you should be living your life apart from the promises that God has just for you. That's right. That's right. Man, we are to be living what God promised us. There are no excuses for us. Once the word has been preached to us, we are without excuse. And so if I continue living my life apart from what God said I could have, the good life, the Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come, Jesus said, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And so if my life is looking more like I'm being stolen from, things are being killed and destroyed in my life, and I don't look like I'm living the abundant life that Jesus came to give me, give me I, I wonder, what am I believing? Because there are things in here that I can believe God for because he told me I could. And so I want, to, I want to spark your hope in God's promises for you again this morning. There is hope in God's word. And so let's open up in, uh, I guess that's not, we're not opening up. We're going to just continue here in Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 5. We're gonna read, I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. If you don't have that, that's fine. He's going to put it on the screen and you can read through it. But I'm going to read through uh, these accounts in Luke chapter 1 when the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah who was the father of John the Baptist, and then he appeared to Mary, okay? So we're going to read through these, okay? You good with that? Good thing. That's what I'm doing. All right, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. It says, During the reign of King Herod the Great over Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah who served in the temple as part of the priestly order of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also from a family of priests, being a direct descendant of Aaron. They were both lovers of God, living virtuously, and following the commandments of the Lord fully. But they were childless since Elizabeth was barren, and now they both were quite old. Does this remind you of any other story in the Bible of Abraham and Sarah? 
It says, one day while Zechariah's priestly order was on duty and he was serving as priest, it happened by the casting of lots according to the custom of the priesthood that the honor fell upon Zechariah to enter into the holy place and burn incense before the Lord. And I started studying this a little bit, and this is the first time that I saw this, but this this, I was just thinking, well, this is just what the priests do. This, this was like a once-in-a-lifetime thing for Zechariah. With as many priests as there were in that day, like you, and, and they, they cast lots, they do all this stuff to see who goes in. Like This was like, he hasn't done this before. This was a once-in-a-lifetime thing for him. So he, he goes into the temple, and, uh, and a large crowd of worshipers had gathered to pray outside the temple at the hour when incense was being offered. All at once, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing just to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was startled and overwhelmed with fear. But the angel reassured him, saying, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God is showing grace to you, for I have come to tell you that your prayer for a child has been answered. Wow. And so we see here that that Zechariah and Elizabeth were childless, but they were believing God for a child. Right? Right? And, and I know that they have basis to believe God for a child because of what God has done for their ancestors. The, whole, the only reason that they're there right now is because Abraham and Sarah believed God for a child. And God said, you're going to have a son, and God did what he said he would do. And so they have basis to believe and to pray to God for a child. So we know that they've been praying for a child, right? That's what the Bible tells us. So the angel goes on to say, and he talks about your Elizabeth, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, your name, to name him John, his birth will bring you much joy and gladness, and he, he goes on to talk about all that, all that John's going to do, but skip down to verse 18 if you can. In verse 18, and I want, I want us to go back to what he, he said to, to Zechariah, I have come to tell you that your prayer for a child has been answered. Zechariah asked the angel, how do you expect me to believe this? Wow. Did the Bible not tell us that Zachariah and Elizabeth had been praying for a child? So if they've been praying for a child this whole time, what kind of prayers were those? If when God sends an angel to tell you that I'm answering your prayer, and you say, how do you expect me to believe this? Holy cow. If you've been praying to God for something and you find out that it's going to come to pass in your life, but it may not look the way, like, and you say, how am I supposed to believe this because of what things look like? Were you ever believing to begin with? Look at what he says. How do you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man and my wife is too old to give me a child. And looking at, what, looking at the circumstances and the natural and looking at what you have and your limitations will never, ever, ever allow God's promise to overtake your life. That's right. You cannot look at where you're at and what you have if, you, if you're believing God. Yeah. He said, what sign can you give me to prove this will happen? <laughs> then the angel said, I'm Gabriel. <laughs> I can just imagine, you can just imagine like, are you kidding me? He said, I'm Gabriel. He, he, I stand beside God himself. He has sent me to announce to you this good news. But now, since you did not believe my words, you will be stricken silent and unable to speak until the day my words have been fulfilled at their appointed time and a child is born to you. That will be your sign. <laughs> That's going to be your sign. And I thought about this, and I was like, God, if, if he responded this way, when he had been believing you for a child, and then says, how do you expect me to believe this? How, how was it that he still got a child? And, and I didn't really come to a conclusion. I'm just coming to this now. This is just now coming out. But one... God's goodness is far greater than your ability to believe him. God wants to bless you even when you don't believe him. Because he's good. And two, God had to get John the Baptist into the earth. He was the forerunner before Jesus. This was going to happen whether Zechariah cooperated or not. Like he had to do something to cooperate with, but that wasn't going to be a problem for him, right? Right? <laughs> 
And so God was going to get his promise into the earth. And he said, because you didn't believe and your words are not lining up with God's word now, you're not going to be able to talk until this happens because we can't have you ruin this. Man, do you ever wish that you, your mouth could be shut when you believe God for something and, and things start coming up like, man, it really doesn't look like what I prayed for is going to happen. Well, why don't you keep your mouth shut and just continue to say what God says, and it will. John the Baptist didn't just appear right then. There's a period, there's a period from when the promise, he said, you're going to have this from when you actually have it. Right? We, we shouldn't expect any different in our own lives. I saw a footnote in verse 20 that says, Since Zechariah asked for a sign rather than believe the word of the Lord, he was given the sign of silence. Unbelief keeps a priest from speaking until faith arises. I thought that was interesting. Unbelief keeps a, a priest from speaking until faith arises. That should, really, that should really be the same with us. We better not be speaking up and having words come out of our mouth until faith is there and we're going to say what God said. That's right. So good. <clears throat> Man, the importance of your words, I, I, I can't, I can't ex, expound on this enough this morning. The importance of your words is so huge. And you may have heard this in church before, and you may have heard that life and death are in the power of the tongue, and all that may seem very churchy and too vague for you, and it may be seem, seem too hard. I can't just watch every word I say. Okay, then. Be okay with just having what you say. That's, that's, all, that's all we're saying here. Like, you just have to be okay with having whatever you say. <laughs> because the truth is what God's word says. Life and death are found with what you say. They're found right here. If you want your will to match God's will, then your words are going to have to match his words. You want the will of God for your life? You better start having come out of your mouth the word of God for your life. <clears throat> And, and I always love this, too, when we read stories like this. Like, well, yeah, if an angel, if an angel would appear to me and tell me that my prayer is going to be answered, I would believe it. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> Zechariah, the Bible said that they were praying for this. He's a priest. They were good, virtuous people, the Bible tells us. And he still didn't believe. If you can't believe that written word, that Bible laying in your lap right now, you will not believe if Jesus himself stood before you and told it to your face. You are lying to yourself if you think that you'll believe then. You will not believe until you believe the written word of God. And if you say that you can't believe this, then you can't believe it. Because you said you can't. You can if you wanted to. You could if you wanted to. Let's look at Luke chapter 1. We're going to scroll on down to verse 26. Let's look at... Let's look at how a Mary, how her encounter with Gabriel went. In verse 26, it says, During the sixth month, sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God's presence to an unmarried girl named Mary living in Nazareth, a village in Galilee. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a true descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Grace to you, young woman, for the Lord is with you, and so you are anointed with great favor. Mary was deeply troubled over the words of the angel and bewildered over what this may mean for her. It's interesting that like the angel just said this to her and Mary already, she was already bewildered. Like when I think of bewildered, I'm like, hmm. Like how do you have time to contemplate and be bewildered with what was just said? Like, I, like how much time had passed here? Did the angel just let her bewilder for a little while? I, it's just when you're reading this, that, this is just the things that I think. So welcome to my mind. <laughs> But the angel reassured her, saying, Do not yield to your fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you and has chosen to surprise you with a wonderful gift. You will become pregnant with a baby boy, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be supreme and will be known as the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will enthrone him as king on his ancestor David's throne. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and his reign will have no limit. Mary said, But how could this happen? I'm still a virgin. And so we see another question here to, to Gabriel when he tells her what's going to happen. Now, keep in mind, let's, let's think about the context. This is far different from Zachariah's experience. One, Zachariah was married and, and, and 
hopefully for him, had been doing the thing that causes kids to come along for a long time now, okay? (laughs) Two, he had been praying specifically for a child for a long time. Like, I I didn't see why Mary was bewildered. Like, what is happening right now? Okay? A teenage girl, an angel just appears to her, and and this is happening. And she says, how is this going to happen? I'm still a virgin. That's a legitimate question right there. Because up to this point, and and I've never known of another virgin birth, aside from this right here. Mary certainly didn't know. She said, I'm still a virgin. Gabriel answered, the spirit of holiness will fall upon you, and Almighty God will spread his shadow of power over you in a cloud of glory. This is why the child born to you will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And if I'm Mary, I'm like, you know, okay, can you go into more detail about what that's going to look like? The spirit of holiness will fall upon me, and he'll spread his shadow of power over me in a cloud of glory. Am I, should this be like a real cloud? What am I, what am I to expect? I don't, this is just me. I, like, I would be, you know, maybe I'm more in Zacharias' camp here, but asking some questions about what's gonna, what this is going to look like. But I love what, what Gabriel does here. He said, what's more, your aged aunt Elizabeth has also become pregnant with the son. The barren one, as they called her, is now in her sixth month. He, he comes to her and he said, and he's basically saying, I know a lot of this kind of sounds crazy to you, but I want to tell you that the barren one, your aunt, the one who couldn't have a kid, she's in her sixth month right now because God promised her something too. So he's like building faith in Mary for her response. And uh, Gabriel said, not one promise from God is empty of power. Say that with me. Not one promise, not one promise. from God, from God. Is, empty is empty of power. For nothing is impossible with God. Thank then Mary responded, saying, listen to this. this. Listen to her response compared to Zechariah's. This is amazing. I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. May everything you have told me come to pass. Woo! Compare that with Zechariah's. How do you expect me to believe this? Yeah. Yeah. How do you expect me to believe this? And she said, this is amazing! Yeah. Wow! Are you kidding me? Me? Well, I'm here, I'm here to serve the Lord. Whatever he has for me, may it come to pass yeah. in my life. Yeah. Man, that should be our response to God's word. Yeah. So good. And, and as I was looking at this, I was thinking, what, what were some of the differences between Zachariah's response and between Mary's response? And one of the things that I was just looking at, just thinking about, was their age. Zachariah was on in years a little bit. The Bible tells us Mary's a teenager. And, and they've had certainly different life experiences, obviously. And, and I think that's kind of key here. I mean, there's a reason that Jesus tells us that we're to come to him and to approach him as little children do, right? Because little children, they don't superimpose their own experiences and, and, and what's happened in their life onto what God said to them. They just say, oh, God said that? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll have that. Right. We say, oh, God said that? Well, I don't know how that can happen because I've seen this and I've heard this and I've experienced this. I mean, right. sh- come on. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. We superimpose our own experiences on God's word all the time. Yeah. Kids don't have that problem. This is why kids so easily and readily believe in Santa and whatever uh, their parents want to tell them. This is why Jesus tells us, come to me as a little child. I'm telling you, even as an adult, I don't care what you've been through in your life, what you have experienced, you can make a choice today to come to him as a little child and to just simply believe what he said. You can take what God said at face value and know that's what he meant and that's what he wants for you. Just as a little kid does. You can do that today. There are some of you in here who maybe your hearts are hardened by the things that you've seen and the things that you've experienced. That can change today. That can change today. God's word, God's word supersedes any experience that you've had, the things that you've seen in your life. God's word does that. And so I I referenced last week when Pastor Ben, he, he brought up specifically just like, kind of rapid fire brought up some of the promises of God. 
And I was sitting there thinking, yeah, I mean, I've, we've heard these before. I know these are promises of God. And, and you can sit there and you can do the same thing. Oh, I've heard about that. God's promised me healing. Next. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that. God's promised me peace. Yeah, I know. God's promised me joy. God's promised me this. God's promised me that. And we move on from it. Apparently, we need to hear this again, and we need to camp here a little bit. Because there's a reason why we continue to, God wants us to talk about the promises that he has for us. I mean, the words in God's word, when he promises us something, they're just as real as the word that Gabriel brought from the throne of God to Zechariah and to Mary. In fact, they're much more real than that. They're much more real than that, if you can believe it. I mean, what Gabriel was doing, he was, he was helping facilitate getting the word of God, the, the, the physical word of God into the earth. Jesus is the word. And until the word entered the earth, we, you know, we knew a little bit about God's will and everything from the Old Testament, but Jesus demonstrated God's will here on the earth. So we can see what Jesus did, and we can hear what Jesus said, and we can know that's his will for us, and the promises that he's told us about, we can partake in. And I want to take, I want to take five minutes here, and I want to go through these, and I want you to listen. If there's something in your life that, that if there's a hole in your life, if there's something that, that you feel like, man, God's probably got a promise for that, then you need to hear it. You know, in fact, I just want to go through this because I found myself in this place at various times in my life, especially over the last 10, to 10 years or so. If, if you consider yourself a veteran Christian, and I use quotation marks very sarcastically because once you've been living a life of faith, for a little while, you know what that can look like after a while? Not so much a life of faith. It can look a lot like a life of complacency. Because you might have experienced God's uh, amazing word to you at one point and believed God for a breakthrough in your life and you experienced a breakthrough and you knew the fight of faith that it took. And the fight of faith is simply standing on what God's word says no matter what it may look like. That's what the fight is. And this is why there are not many people fighting. Because once circumstances, once things arise in their life that's contrary to what God said, they give up on it and say, well, this is what I see, so I guess it's just not going to happen. And many of us veteran Christians are living this life of complacency. In fact, I wrote this down, and I just want to read it as it is right here. We settle in the comforting arms of mediocrity when things are pretty good. And, and just like I just said, many times we see breakthroughs in our lives and we understand the fight of faith that it took to see it through. And then we let up because we have what was promised. And then we can settle into just this comforting mindset and stop applying any pressure at all to the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. And so for, if you find yourself in that place, and this isn't a condemning thing. I mean, my gosh, I recognize myself in this place. And so if you feel like I'm preaching at you, then you're just going to have to change how you're receiving what I'm saying. Because I'm preaching to you. Uh, we were talking last night, right? My wife had always told me she hates when I preach at her. And so, and I get it. Like, people don't like being preached at. But I'm not saying you, 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 you. That's preaching at. I'm saying me, 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 us, 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 us. I'm preaching right now, okay? And so, if you feel like you're being preached at, then that's on you. That's a you problem. That's not a me problem. I'm just going to bring what the Word of God says. Okay? But here's, here's what I said. What am I fighting for when it seems like there's nothing to fight for? If I feel like I've kind of arrived in this place, I've seen God do some things, and I'm in a pretty good place in my life. Have I arrived at the fullness of God's promises in his word? I want you to ask yourself this. Have you arrived at the fullness of God's promises in his word? Let me, let me, I'll, let me paint a picture of what that looks like real quick. Do I, do, do you, I'll just say I, do I or anyone in my family ever experience symptoms in our bodies that wouldn't represent wholeness that Jesus came to give us? Well, yeah, but, you know, we live in this world and, you know, you, you're just going to get sick every once in a while. Okay, if you say so. I, I'm simply here to tell you, people don't, we don't like to hear this. Guys, I'm talking to every single person in this room. 
Because sickness is prevalent, and the common cold can come on someone, and it hits, and it passes, and it's like, ah, you know, it's just, it happens. And it's no condemnation. Like, we all, this this is something we all experience. And so as I'm reading this and thinking about this, why would Jesus offer us a promise that's only good for sometimes? And if he promised us healing, wouldn't it be possible that we, were, we should be able to experience the fullness of what he gave us? All the time? All the time. And so when we experience certain things in our life that don't look like what God said, we put the onus back on God. We don't want to take the responsibility for the things in our life and we'll just say, well, that's, it just happens to everyone. And so we include ourselves in that bunch there. Do I have more than enough? Yeah, uh, things are pretty good. We're pretty set financially. Things are pretty good. Do I have more than enough to give to every good work? Every good work. Is my family out of debt? Has my church fulfilled its purpose because I'm able to finance the vision God gave them? Guys, I can tell you right now, none of us are here yet because the vision that God's given this place, we're not there yet. So what I'm saying is every person in this place is in a place where they can believe God for more seed to sow. Everyone in here. Do I experience heavenly sleep every night? God's promised that I could. Are my kids walking in the peace of God? Do my emotions get the better of me more times than not? Am I experiencing thoughts of fear? Do I ever get anxious or stressful about what's going on? Are there dead things in my life that need to be resurrected? Do I love my wife like Christ loves the church? I can go on and on. What I'm saying, every single one of those questions has a specific promise from God attached to it that, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can. And so if you've come in here and you just wanted to hear something encouraging or you've come in here because it's Sunday morning and this is what you do at church and and you're in a place where you're not going to put yourself out there and believe God for something, we've got to get past that, guys. We've got to get past that. You better put yourself out there and start applying some pressure to the kingdom of darkness and seeing God's promises come to pass in your life. This is not just for you. This is for the people that you're to impact in this life. Man, you, do, you think, do you think that I believe in God uh, uh, taking pleasure in the prosperity of his servant? I'm his servant, that's me. Yeah. No, I, you know what? I want to be rich because Jesus was made poor so that I would be made rich. Yeah. I don't want him to have been made poor in vain. Yeah. I, I don't want to be rich to, to just lavish it all on myself. Man, I'm part of this body right here and the vision that we have is going to take a lot of money. If we, the church, aren't the ones to fund that, who's going to do it? Do we just think this stuff happens? And it's on on me. If no one else, I'm going to be responsible for seeing that the vision of the place that God's called me to comes to pass. And if that requires me to be a millionaire, I'm going to be a millionaire. But I only work in this job that pays me this much. That's not how God's going to bless me. It requires faith to realize a promise from God, and faith comes one way and one way only, by hearing his word. You cannot separate God's promise from his word. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 15. Luke 2, 15, in the Passion, it says, When the choir of angels disappeared back to heaven, the shepherds said to, to one another, Let's go, let's hurry and find this word that is born in Bethlehem and see for ourselves what the Lord has revealed to us. Wow. Let's see. They didn't say, let's go see this baby. That the, let's go see this word. Mm. Another word here is the manifestation. It's the promise. Yeah. Yeah. Every promise of God originates from a word right. from God. Right. Every single one. Right. If you go on down in, in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 28, this is, you know, a week after Jesus had been born, they took him to the temple to circumcise him. And it says, Simeon cradled the baby in his arms and praised God and prophesied, saying, Lord and Master, I am your loving servant, and now I can die content, for your promise to me has been fulfilled. With my own eyes, I have seen 
your word. I have seen your word. If we no longer get exciting by seeing a promise in God's word when it's in our Bible and we read it right there, that's the same level as excitement that we would show as if that promise was made manifest right before our very eyes. Let me say that again. If you read a promise in God's word that by his stripes you were healed and you experiencing the fullness of that healing, that feeling, and, and, and all of that right there, it is the same. We have to look at the word the same as the manifestation of that word. It's the same. They are one in the same. They're one in the same. And I want to challenge you this week. I want to challenge you to find one promise in God's word. You know how easy it is to find a promise in God's word? Where, are you lacking something in your life? You know, do you need joy, peace? Do you need, do you need to, to show love to others better? Do you need to exercise patience a little better? Are you, are you lacking financially? Do you need healing in your body? Is there someone in your family who needs something? Have you not been sleeping at night? Is fear overtaking you? Guys, there's a promise for something that you're going through. You know how easy it is to find? Scriptures on joy. Google it. Google it. Scriptures on this. I challenge you. Find one this week and just read it. Just read a scripture. Just read a scripture this week, once every day, until it gets in you. Let's look at Psalms chapter 130. Verses 3 through 5, it says, Lord, if you measured us and marked us with our sins, who would ever have their prayers answered? But your forgiving love is what makes you so wonderful. No wonder you were loved and worshipped. This is why I wait upon you, expecting your breakthrough. For your word, it brings me hope. God's word is what will bring you hope. God's word is what will bring you hope. If you're hopeless and you're missing something in your life, God's word is the answer. Jesus, Jesus is the answer. There's a promise for that. There's a promise for whatever you're missing in your life. There's a promise from God from that, for that. Let's stand this morning. And I want to read one more verse as we're standing in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says, Now may God, the inspiration and fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his superabundance until you radiate with hope. You know, this is what it should look like when you're living in hope. This is what it should look like. May he fill you to overflowing with joy, uncontainable joy and perfect peace. When your trust is in God, these are the symptoms that you will experience. Uncontainable joy and perfect peace. So if neither one of those symptoms are evident in your life, I would check your trust level in God. When you're trusting him, those are the things you'll start experiencing. <laughs> and keep that feeling. Keep that. Because once you start trusting God and start experiencing those things, God's going to see his word through all the way until it's manifested in your life. Yeah. Let's bow our heads. Everyone bow your heads. Let's close your eyes. You know, if you've never entered a relationship with the source of hope, with Jesus, that's the first step into ever experiencing a life here on this earth filled with hope. Until, until you've entered a relationship with hope himself, there's not going to be a lot of hope for you here in this world. But once you've made him your Lord and your Savior, you have hope for right here and now. And so if you've got to take that first step and say, I, man, I, I need hope in a lot of areas in my life and, and I feel kind of perpetually hopeless, I want to introduce you to the one who can give you hope. 
It's an eternal hope. It's not just for the here and now. This is something, this is something making Jesus your Lord is the only way to heaven. He is the only way. And so I want to give you that opportunity if you're in this place with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you haven't made Jesus your Lord and Savior and you want to this morning, I want you to slip your hand up. And I want to pray a prayer with you. And, and I want to make sure everyone in here has that opportunity. I don't see any hands, but I want, with everyone's head still bowed, I, I want us all to pray this together. Because there, there may be someone in here who, do, who didn't raise their hand. Or there may be someone in your life who you know needs Jesus. And this is how we're to pray with them. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he raised him from the dead, that we'll be saved. And it's that simple. So everyone in here, repeat this after me. Father God, I confess that Jesus is my Lord. I believe that you sent him to die on the cross for my sins. And he rose again on the third day. Jesus, I call you Lord. You're my Savior. Thank you for filling my life with hope. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to close with a song this morning. And it's a song about hope. And we're going to open up the altar. And guys, we've got, we've got some time. And so we're just going to open up the altar. And we're not going to pray with anyone. Uh, this is just for you. I talked this morning about how there are great and precious promises all in God's word. And if you know that you're lacking or missing something in your life, it's in here. It is in God's word to you. And if you're lacking hope, come get it this morning. Come to the altar. I'm going to be up here. I need, I need hope, and, I, and I, need, I need to see what God has promised me come to pass in my life. But come up here. We're going to open it up and sing this song, but just enter in, and we'll close it up this morning.